Just one more minute. Many seats available just in front here, so if you want to come close. Okay, good, so I Time to start. So uh, this is uh, the second session with our second keynote speaker, okay, Professor Menchu Zhou from New Jersey Institute of uh, Technology. So we know each other since uh, many years so far. Yeah? And Menchu is a distinguished professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He got many different fellowships, uh, including the IoT Poly Fellowship. Okay. Um, today, he will give us a, a talk related to, uh, as you may see from the title, related to edge, heterogeneous edge networks. Uh, I'd like to add also that Meng Shu is a uh, really prolific uh, author, more than 1,000 publications, um, more than 600 IP poly transactions, okay, along with books, patents, conference papers, and so forth. Currently, he's the editor-in-chief of uh, uh, IEEE CAA Journal of Automatica Sinica, and also his uh, uh, editorial activities is significant. And uh, um, he also received many grants from uh, you know, different uh, institutions uh, in USA, in China, and even uh, elsewhere. So uh, let's welcome uh, our keynote, okay? <laughs> so we have uh, uh, let's say 45 minutes yeah. just to give time for questions. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you. <laughs> it's really kind of pleasure to be here. I love for you know this site, although it's a little bit uh, inconvenient for us to travel here, right? <laughs> because we have to go to Rome first, then you know wait for a couple of hours, then come to you know, this small airport. Fortunately, this hotel is nearby the airport, right? And they, you know, we have excellent weather, and excellent food, so you know, very warm people here. So I really love this place. I love for dinner. <laughs> yeah, we know each other. I know Professor Fortino for many years. One of the reasons is that he's also excellent tennis player. So we enjoy playing tennis with each other, so really a yeah, good, good time with, you know, we, we, we do have an excellent time together. Yeah, uh, you know, in, under my uh, name, I mentioned a few uh, associations. I want to express it. RFAC means the International Federation of Automatic Control. That's kind of international organization without actual individual membership. I don't pay any membership fee because their membership is all the national automatic control related organizations. Like in China, Chinese Associ Association of Automation is its member, right? So that's the IFAC. AAS means American Association for Advancement of Science. Uh, this uh, organization is famous 
because they are impacting a lot of science-related issues, policies in the USA. And they published the, the, one of the most famous uh, magazine called Science. Right? That's why it's, uh, it's, it's so famous. By the way, I never published in Science, but uh, you know, they do admit uh, people from engineering field uh, to be their fellows. Uh, CAA is the Chinese Asso Association for Pension. That's one of the largest organization in China, and we have a lot of collaboration between CAA and other organizations, including IEEE. In fact, uh, uh, Professor uh, Fortino just mentioned the journal IEEE CAA, Journal of Automatica Sinica. I'm going to talk a little more about that in my talk. That's really the first journal uh, co-sponsored by IEEE and outside IQP organization, outside USA organization. And it's a, it's a very successful journal. So now IQP is seeking more collaborations with uh, many other Chinese journals, Indian journals, Japanese journals, etc. So that's really our journal basically led that way to today's uh, more and more active collaboration between IQP and uh, emerging, you know, uh, countries and their journals. NAI means National Academy of Invent Inventors. You know, uh, that's a uh, USA organization, of course. Uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, I have uh, several inventions. Uh, in fact, more, more than several, 31 patents, international patents. And many of them are in really in the application, commercial application. And some inventions currently under my own small companies in the US, they try to develop it uh, into a company, like a, a commercial company, uh, about uh, how to uh, produce clean water from any industrial waste water, from ocean water as well. So that's uh, one of the uh, inven invention my colleagues in mechanical engineering department and I, you know, uh, we are trying to commercialize that particular technology. Now, NJIT is located at, at Newark, New Jersey. It's like uh, only a few minutes away from New York City. The airport for the Newark uh, International Liberty Airport is really convenient uh, to my university and to my house, my home. Only 15 minutes from my university. So I told uh, Professor Fortino, whenever he has like three hours in Newark Airport, I'm going to pick him up at the New York Airport, come to my school to play some tennis or to have some nice meal that I can send him back to catch the flight. So this invitation to everyone here. It's in particular if you like uh, you know, some uh, excellent food, Spanish food, because uh, New York has a Spanish Portuguese kind of town that their food is excellent. You know, I mean, in the U.S., they have the best Spanish and the Portuguese food there in at New York, very nearby. And also, we have in fact a, a train from uh, from airport to the, the the Spanish you know town, like only ten minutes trip, very convenient. So, so welcome to you know uh, my place. Now, India is uh, uh, listed as a like top uh, fifty national public university and uh, around like top 100 of all the universities together. We do have uh, number one nationally in student economic upward mobility. This really means we have for uh, you know, incoming students, they pay tuition. When they graduate, they get excellent salary. So that salary divided by tuition fee, NJIT is top. The reason that NJIT has uh, students, mostly in engineering, computer science, so all those students can earn a lot when after they graduate, after their graduation. In fact, in high state New Jersey, highs are my university students you know, in their companies, like a third of engineers from my university. That's why it's, it's doing really, really doing fine job. Also, New York City offers a lot of excellent high paid jobs to our students, so that's why we can be uh, num uh, number one in this particular category. And if you 
have any questions, let me know. Now before my talk, we had, I want to also introduce to you I2P Press Wild Cook Series and System Science and Engineering. By the way, uh, Professor Fortino has a, a, an I2P Wild Cook Series on human machine systems. So if you have some right topic regarding books, welcome to contact us. Now I want to bring this up because I want to also tell a story why you know, I you know, encourage you young professionals or senior professors to write books, right? As a young professional, in, in particular, you know, uh, I feel if you have uh, the ability to publish the two good journal papers per year, you have time, you want to consider writing a monograph. If you have more time, then you consider writing a textbook. But uh, really, to me, I think that young professionals should uh, write monograph instead of textbook. Why the textbook takes much longer time? And it's less helpful in helping you establish your position in your career, in, you know, international-wide or national-wide. Monograph is easier. You, if you have uh, multiple papers, like six, seven papers in the field, then you can always try to expand them, plus some other you know, fundamental theory to write a monograph. I cite myself as an example. I got my PhD in 1990 from Lisbeth Polytechnic Institute. Three years later, I published the, the first monograph in my area, you know, based on my thesis. Of course, my thesis is it has about uh, six, seven excellent journal papers, right? So it's very easy for me to put a monograph. So then, now when I went to tenure and promotion, some senior professors really write very strong words about my book, you know, about my research. They say, hey, this book is really motivating them to do deeper research in the field. And this is really the first monograph in this particular field. Right? So that really helps your case when you go to the you know, uh, uh, university promotion and the tenure committee, promotion committee, you, you can easily you know, write through. Okay. So that's why I think that it's, uh, it's important for young professionals especially to consider writing a monograph in your field. Right? So if you have uh, some topics falling into my area or Professor Fortino's area, welcome to contact us. We are going to give you you know, the sample proposal or to, to, to give you some advice for the kind of ops might be best fit or might be best selling so that you can get them. Now in my book series, we have already published over 20 titles, mostly focusing on the like, machine learning, uh, systems engineering approach, etc. And uh, uh, some, some very recent one, uh, including like, uh, Industry 4.1, this is really about uh, intelligent manufacturing uh, in the area of semiconductor manufacturing, you know, wafer, uh, wafer fabrication. So uh, Professor Chen is very famous in Taiwan, has been working in this area for many, many years. And this uh, 21st book is from uh, uh, two professors in New Mexico, uh, Mexico. They, 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 they talk about, uh, this book about, is about human robot interaction control using reinforcement learning. And the last book to, to appear in November uh, this year is my own co author book for the sustainable manufacturing system and energy perspective. We really want to you know, have the uh, energy efficient manufacturing processes without uh, sacrificing productivity we want to reduce the energy consumption. Now, this is particularly important in today's you know, uh, world with uh, the war going on, right? So this book uh, is going to uh, publish in, in a couple of months. We just finished the proof reading at the last stage. Now, this book series covers uh, basically those system kind of you know, uh, uh, monographs and textbooks in print. In particular, complex systems, disk event systems, network systems, and uh, control systems, transportation systems, and uh, you know, smart manufacturing systems, smart grade power systems, etc., and also robotics. So 
So if you have some good ideas, then, you know, let me know. Uh, we'll be, I'll be happy to, you know, to accommodate. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or you know, raise your question, raise your hand. Now, next uh, small item is about uh, the journal I, uh, both the Professor Fortino and I mentioned, IHP, IHP uh, CA journal uh, on automatic clinical. So its impact factor is really high now, 7.847. It's uh, ranked top seven out of 65 automation control system journals. In terms of site, site four, it's number one among 118 control and optimization journals. So that's very really good. Then top 20 among 260 non-artificial intelligence related journals. So it's a highly ranked. And our acceptance rate is around 15, uh, 10 to 15%, depending on percent. So it's uh, quite competitive. And we also have national and uh, worldwide uh, you know, uh, authorship. Professor Fortino has uh, some papers as well, and uh, we have you know, uh, papers from MIT, Princeton, etc. Okay. Also, we some uh, entertain some uh, special issues. Again, Pro Professor Fortino and his colleagues have had uh, published some special issues in this journal as well. So, uh, if you have excellent idea for some special issues, uh, you know, just email me. We'll be able to evaluate them. Now, of course, we have uh, two excellent uh, paper, best paper awards uh, set for this uh, uh, journal. Uh, the first one, the best paper award, is named after uh, Xue Zheng Qian. He was uh, considered as the father of control engineering in China. He got his PhD from Caltech. He worked for JPL, uh, you know, for a few years. Then, after you know, Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, uh, got the control in China, you know, uh, he came back to build up the, the, the new China, right? And he has contributed uh, to the, uh, like, missile control, etc. a lot. So it's very really significant uh, in China. And the Nobel winner review paper, best review paper, what a Nobel winner is the father of uh, sub <coughs> He, you know, he basically created the field of subnetics, an MIT professor. Right? He also made a lot of contributions to other fields like uh, communications, computing, etc. Normally we, uh, we choose the best paper from past you know, one to three uh, published papers like this. For example, this year the best paper will be selected from the papers in 2019, 2020, and uh, 2021. Okay. So the best paper really, in general, we try to select from the uh, well-cited papers. So if you have good, excellent citation counts, and uh, the paper contains some very good contributions, it might be selected. We gave for quite a lot of money, 20,000 uh, UMD means uh, over three, thousand uh, US dollars. So it's a pretty good uh, amount of money. And uh, if you want I2P transaction best paper, normally you get like a thousand dollars. So you are, 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 are rewarding money is triple that amount. So again, I you know we welcome you to try to you know, contribute uh, your excellent work to this journal. And we also are pretty fast in about uh, uh, one to two months. Let me know if you have papers uh, there for too long time. I will immediately act on it. Now we have uh, currently running a few issues related to today's topic as well. One is machine learning for industry 4.0. This special issue is for ITP robotics and automation technique. The deadline is uh, October 15. So we have uh, about a month left. So if, in, in case you have to write papers, Again, welcome to 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 you know consult uh, with me, and uh, I will immediately tell you whether your work fits or not, etc. In addition to this, 
I'm currently running another issue for the human cyber physical systems for intelligent manufacturing, right? Intelligent automation. So uh, this is for actually trends on automation science and engineering. And uh, the, the deadline is November 30th. Okay. So this is the related uh, cyber physical systems, uh, one of our conferences here, so to speak, right? So you certainly are welcome to, again, to contact me if you have some, any proper papers for this session issue. The last one is related to big data, again, the part of the conference here, big data and the computational social intelligence for guaranteed financial security. That's for actually trends on computational social systems. The deadline is uh, October 31st, so you have a month and a half left. In case you have big data related papers, if you can handle some financial related uh, you know, uh, data, perfect, you can always come to me. Okay, so that's really the uh, kind of, uh, you know, the special issues for IGP related journals. Now, if you have really uh, have some kind of papers you want to publish immediately, then we have a special issue running currently for open, uh, open access journal centers uh, called Intelligent Monitoring, Control, and Optimization in Industry 4.0. Now, open access journal, the feature is that it's really, really fast. You send me a paper in, probably a month later, the paper will print it, right? So it's very, very fast. So if when you have some papers, you definitely need to publish it. Within this year, try this special issue. We are really handling very fast. Normally, a week or two, you get the first line uh, revision. I mean, first uh, decision. Probably another, you know, one or two weeks, you have uh, your revision will be reviewed. Now, if uh, the paper doesn't have uh, major defects, it will most likely accept it. Once accepted, it will appear in, you know, the journal. That's why, you know, in case we have for some right papers, you have budget to pay the, uh, the, the open access fee, you know, certainly you should consider this. Of course, if you are famous enough, I will be able to secure fee waiver for this. Okay, so again, can't happen. Normally, my editorial people will, will check your background. If your background is good enough, yes, we can give you complete waiver of fee or whatever. So, you know, because this journal really uh, chased me for a few times to have a special issue, that okay, I, I can submit. Because this is really my personal interest in the uh, industry for right? So that's uh, why I submit this. Now, uh, we come to our uh, today's topic. I'm going to have uh, six parts, introduction, motivation, problem definition, how to solve them, then we come to performance evaluation, and then we have a bit summary. So in the, you know, uh, today's, uh, you know, uh, environment, you are going to see many, you know, uh, mobile devices, we call the MD. Yeah. They are under, you know, uh, they, are, they, are, they are widely utilized in smart home scenario, in internet of vehicle scenario, you know, or, or in like, body sensor and scenario you have to work, you know, those wearable devices. All these devices, they could be considered uh, like mobile devices, mo 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 mobile devices because uh, you know, they move a lot, right? Uh, imagine all those vehicles are eventually to have the complete uh, communication capability. They are able to communicate, you know, uh, with each other in, I mean, among people, right? And in a smart home, you know, we have for all those, uh, you know, uh, so-called IoT enabled devices. In my, at least in my home, we have all, you know, Wi-Fi driven lights, Wi-Fi driven thermal systems. Uh, just a few days ago, my son also installed a, a lock. So the good thing is that when not, whenever I depart house, I don't fear it will not be locked because at three minutes, it's automatically locked myself. The, the, another feature is when, I, when, when I'm coming back to home, right? You know, when I'm near the garage, the door will be automatically unlocked. 
this feature, I think I really like it because now I, I'm, I don't sort of fear whether I, you know, bring a key with me or not. I will be able to, able to enter my house now, right? So you know, all these things are really, you know, all programming well. Uh, so we do have sometimes, uh, you know, uh, locally, you know, you run computer teaching intensive applications. And in particular, if you have uh, kids, they are really into like, sometimes video games, sometimes you watch movie, etc. And uh, sometimes you might do some kind of uh, in, uh, uh, limited uh, clarification, uh, object recognition. Those are the kind of you know, computation intensive applications. Now, in your mobile devices, normally you have limited CPU, limited memory limited power, uh, limited battery power. Sometimes you have very limited uh, uh, communication channels. Yeah, 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 wireless media is not that powerful. So often you find that you cannot run all the applications in your mobile devices when you are really doing this like natural language processing, augmented reality, or sometimes when you need to do the environmental monitoring, right? So that's why we need to think of you know, those kind of offloading of tasks to your servers. That's why mobile edge computing concept comes up, right? In mobile computing, uh, mobile edge computing scenario, you have small base stations, you have macro base stations, and uh, you know, you so small base stations will cover a few mobile devices, but micro base station, you can view them as like cloud in the data center, much, much more powerful. But of course, from uh, macro base station to small base station to your mobile devices, we do need to consider, you know, uh, bandwidth issue because the network is will be involved. So we have to consider like a partial computation offload. This really means you have heavy duty applications at your mobile device side. You need to offload some computational tasks to small base stations or even macro base stations depending upon the scenarios, right? And uh, uh, you, for, for this scenario, you need to consider these issues, delay issues, right? How close to those uh, small base stations, macro base stations, right? Then you need to have the bandwidth consideration and uh, overhead uh, related to the communication, okay? So this has to be now, before I go to some of the modeling and uh, um, heavy duty stuff, I want to show you how industry is applying edge computing concept in their product or in their you know, uh, realization of edge computing. So this first one is from N A NTT. <laughs> In the future, various information and things will be connected to networks, and we expect it will be. People can now live more convenient and comfortable lives. And with things coordinated together and coordinated with information, it's expected that even more value will be created. At MTT, we're always leading this field, and by staying one step ahead, we will usher in a future that provides new value for everyone. When various information and things are connected to networks, it's referred to as the Internet of Things, or IOT. And huge, varied, and incomplete data generated by IOT need to be processed and responded to in a very short time. Today, the cloud has become an indispensable part of that process. However, the cloud that's been centrally deployed on a global scale needs to process an enormous amount of data. In addition, as the physical distance between the user and the cloud increases, transmission latency increases with it, increasing response time and stressing out the user. 
On top of that, the processing speed in this environment is largely dependent on the performance of the user's device. The solution to these problems is the Edge Computing Platform. The Edge Computing Platform works by allowing some application processing to be performed by a small Edge server positioned between the cloud and user, and crucially in a location physically closer to the user. This allows for some of the workload to be offloaded from the cloud or user's device at a location closer to the user for processing, while speeding up applications that require a low latency response. A good example of an application is a web browser. Web browsers are currently one of the most widespread applications in use by businesses and private users. According to a cabinet office survey, when PC users were asked what they were doing on their PC, 95% responded that they were using the internet. When asked for what, responses included watching videos, research, and downloading data. Things done in a web browser. And in recent years, web browsers have been operating on more and more devices, from set-top boxes and stick PCs to digital signage displays. Yet the usability and display speed of a web browser is heavily dependent on the device's performance. And if it's not up to the task, the wait can be stressful. So, to reduce that stress, NTT has developed a web browser that offloads part of the workload to an Edge server. Using a stick PC, let's compare the display speed of a standard web browser with a new one developed by NTT. As you can see, websites with complex processing like JavaScripts and websites with lots of images in particular load faster in NTT's newly developed browser. And because the web browser's processing is now being performed on the Edge server rather than the device itself, the device's performance mostly becomes irrelevant, allowing support for a wide range of devices. In the near future, various information and things will be connected to networks, and they will collaborate with each other without us being conscious of them at all. NTT will be at the forefront of this transformation, using the Edge Computing Platform to create new applications and provide new value and a richer lifestyle for everyone.
So, uh, yeah, now the motivation of us is that uh, first of all, our CPUs have the kind of capability to like uh, slow down the bit to you know to, to, to save energy, and uh, energy consumption is one of the issues you know involved in both mobile devices as well as edge servers. So. Our goal is really to minimize total energy consumption of mobile devices and edge servers while ensuring all the applications can be performed well. Right? So we need to figure out uh, the realistic uh, partial computation offloading by you know, the determining like offloading ratio tasks, allocation between uh, mobile devices and uh, small base stations, and the bandwidth allocation of available channels among all these uh, uh, mobile devices, and the CPU speed of mobile devices, SDS, and, uh, small base, uh, base stations, and macro base stations, because all these things you know, are related to uh, energy consumption. Right? And of course, we have transmission power of uh, mobile devices to have all the needs. And uh, we try to uh, put forward a, an intelligent optimization method based on very, two very famous uh, approaches. One is for the particle swarm optimization, the other is the generic uh, learning. So now let's define the problem. Basically, we have this kind of uh, you know, uh, edge computing environment. We are dealing with uh, multiple mobile devices and uh, these mobile devices are you know, <coughs> nearby some small base, uh, small base stations, so small base servers, they are small base servers, and then we have much larger uh, servers for the macro base station, right? So a uh, macro base station could uh, connect to many uh, servers, so it's much, much more powerful. So we are really talking about this computation offloading architecture in a kind of hybrid, uh, uh, mobile edge computing system. Now, to formulate the problem, we propose a so called constraint mixed integer nonlinear program. In this particular formu uh, formulation, we need to minimize energy consumption among all the mobile devices and also all the edge servers. So, if you, you know, this is quite a kind of a complicated. Uh, uh, formula involving all the energy, energy consumption, right? And we have uh, many decision variables. These de decision variables, the first uh, batch of decision variables is really which, you know, uh, which small base server should be associated with which mobile devices, right? And then you need to decide the running speed uh, CPU speed uh, for execute, executing some particular tasks in mobile devices. Right? Then you need to also figure out uh, uh, the learning uh, speed uh, for uh, those uh, small base servers and the transmission power and you know, how much bits in total bits should be uh, you know, executed in mobile devices, etc. etc. So these are all the kind of decision variables you have to handle. And you do have constraints. You have to, you know, satisfy these constraints when you are optimizing energy consumption usage, right? Most important one is the maximum application latency limit of each mobile device. In other words, you, you have to finish the task within a given delay. You cannot uh, exceed uh, the delay latency, right? Then you have the maximum transmission power of each mobile device. You have, you have the limitation of the maximum amount of energy in each mobile device, each you know small base server and uh, macro base server. 
and then you have the maximum number of CPU cycles in each uh, device, each server, maximum number of amount of memory in each, you know, uh, a small server and macro based server. In terms of equality constraints, each say, each MD, each mobile device is only connected to a single small based server. And the task in mobile device must be executed in mobile device or small base server or macro based server. Right? Then all mobile devices connected to small based server share the bandwidth of its channels. So the, that 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 balance has to be there as well. So these are the equality constraints. Now these constraints are some some are nonlinear. That's why the problem is very difficult. In fact, it's easy to prove this kind of problem is empty hard. This really means any exact solution approach will fail if you have to many more and many uh, mobile devices, many servers. So you cannot really solve them exactly for the real problem solution. That's why we seek intelligent optimization methods. Now, in, among many intelligent optimization methods, generic algorithm is uh, you know, widely known. Also, classical swarm optimization is widely known. Now, what's their advantages and disadvantages? A very quick uh, summary. GA has the advantage of high diversity of individuals. So it's really like a global search approach. It will, you know, ensure high solution diversity, allow you to explore uh, search space such that you can high possibility to get to, to hit the global one. But the advantage of course is low convergence, right? Now PSO, particle swarm optimizer, it has the advantage of very quick convergence. The disadvantages can be easily trapped into the wrong optimal. So the idea is that we can we combine that to produce a much better approach. The combined approach we call the PGL. Now, of course, I have to, uh, in fact, I may not have, well, let me learn this uh, small intelligence uh, video so that uh, you have a little better understanding uh, uh, why this becomes so important in today's world. <laughs> undulating mass of sleek bodies that bends, breaks, and becomes again. This collective movement is dazzling, but also puzzling. A clear understanding of how and why it happens has been hard to come by, but we're slowly unraveling the mystery behind it all. throughout the world, school at some point in their lives, if not their whole lives. We think this synchronized swimming is at least partly driven by genes that coax fish into groups and affect how well they swim next to their neighbors. Whether it's written in their DNA or something fish learn along the way, schooling has lots of advantages. With all of those eyes, groups of fish have an easier time finding food than solo swimmers. And swimming is less exhausting when fish can draft off their neighbors. Group swims also provide easier access to potential mates and safety in numbers. Schooling fish can confuse predators and mask the signals of individual fish. More fish also means more watchful eyes and better odds of surviving an attack. But just like your high school science class, not all seats in a school are created equal. Sitting up front can be dangerous most predators target these keeners, but they often have better access to food and oxygen-rich water than those in the back. Fish around the edges tend to be in worse shape with weaker skills and more health issues than those in the middle of the pack. But being on the outside also means being closer to food, so no single spot wins out. Once all the fish in a school settle into their positions, how do they shift in unison? Fish watch their neighbors for changes in direction or speed 
and react to keep their place. Other cues come from a series of small sensory organs called a lateral line that can detect subtle vibrations and pressure changes in the water when other fish speed up for a turn. We think individuals self-organize by following simple rules, like stay close but not too close to your neighbor. When everyone follows the rules, the result is synchronized swimming. Like humans though, fish have personalities and these seem to affect how a school moves. Some fish, mostly the front runners at a school, tend to consistently react first to a predator's strike, and then the rest take their cue and follow suit. So schools of fish might in fact have leaders of a sort who steer the group away from predators. Time and more research will tell. Despite all that we've learned, there's still so much we don't understand about school and fish, or swarming birds, herds of animals, or even the collective movement of humans. Studying each of these group behaviors can help us understand the others, allowing us to hone in on how they work and why we do them. And in the meantime, they'll continue to captivate and mesmerize. motivates uh, most of the so-called intelligent optimization efforts, including like a PSO. And uh, in our proposed PTL, we have very you know, uh, simple diagram here, but uh, basically we hybridize PSO and a genetic evidence, so that we are able to hopefully find the globally optimal solution. Unfortunately, the proof is impossible because you have to use your actual running, you know, cases to show the performance very good. For all these approaches, the proof, proving anything is really difficult. The good thing, you know, industrial industrial life, I mean, industrial practice like this kind of approach is that at any moment you can have a relatively good solution. Okay, I got you. So, yeah, I will pass it. I will pass it. So now, of course, we have to convert the constrained problem into unconstrained uh, optimization problem using penalty of what constraint. Simply speaking, if you violate the constraint, then you have a huge penalty. So ensuring that you will not violate any constraint in order to optimize this problem. And then we can have to extend to performance evaluation by very different parameters involved in the actual scenario like number of MDs, number of tests, etc., etc. right? So you run through all these cases, you produce a lot of results. By the way, we have the paper published in I2P, in uh, I2P uh, Internet of Things Journal, so detailed stuff will be there if you really are interested in actual performance evaluation results, you can go to the you know, journal version of the paper. I will simply run through these things but I will do uh, design some benchmark strategies, you know, how are perform how they are performing compared with the proposed one. So again, this data, you know, could mean something to, if you are really looking into the model, and uh, how can we achieve a fairly significant, say, for example, energy consumption, like a 35%, 40%, 38% compared with those approaches without using our scenarios, right? And we also compared uh, this approach with other intelligent optimization approaches. We don't compare with exact solution approach because they couldn't really figure out the solutions given hours of hours of you know, execution time. So that's why we don't do such a sort of a comparison with the exact solutions. And uh, you can easily see you know, the proposed one is really very nice in terms of the conversion in terms of overall performance. And uh, we have some detailed implementation, you know, uh, related issues when you really deploy this kind of approaches to an actual edge computing architecture. Uh, so we can, of course, we can go more detail, but uh, I think I'm running out of time, so we come to the conclusion in the end, right? So basically we want, uh, you know, uh, we have proposed a very realistic uh, partial computation offloading approach. And uh, our proposed uh, PTL is novel, it's effective, 
and we are able to achieve less energy consumption with the faster convergence than other you know benchmark strategies and other you know uh, uh, intelligent optimization approaches. And if you need to do more detail, you can always contact me at this email address there to you at ndi.edu. I promise you I will reply to your email regardless of the you know uh, regardless of the, the email contents. So any questions?
Thank you, Professor, uh, for your brilliant uh, presentation. But I have a question regarding that uh, one is a global solution, like uh, the PSO and the genetic algorithm give us a global solution. So why you uh, merge or why you combine two global uh, solutions, two global algorithms to make a heuristic algorithm? Well, let me answer the question from that way. When you, you are, when you are using PSO, you know, after swarm optimizer, you can quickly converge to an optimal solution. But that solution often is local optimal. Now, if you are using genetic algorithm only, you are doing a lot of stochastic search, basically. Right? So, it's very slow to find a solution in an optimal solution. Yes, you have higher percentage to find a very good solution, excellent solution. So when you combine those tracks together, you have better chance to find the optimal solution in a faster way. That's clearly the key point. Yeah. Either you. approach will not work very well. In fact, we did some comparison, right? So if you use PS only, you end up with bad solution, bad local optimal solution. If you use GA only, you sometimes find a really good solution, but it takes a long, long time. So if you give it a certain time limit, you find a GA performance could be worse than PSO. That's really the reason why we combine them together. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.